as we go as we Great. Well, can I just say, um, my name is John Pilo. I'm a NYP manager in the North Inner City for Trussell China Family Agency and delighted to be asked to chair this event. Responding to Child Parent Violence, NVR. First of all, I would like to say if people, you know, the, the guest speakers um, will be on, have their videos on all the time. But if you're a participant, could you please turn off your video and mute because we will be recording this. And then we will, when we go to questions and answers, everybody can turn back on their video as well. So we'll, we'll have that open question and answer session at the end. So, and saying that, just thank you very much for joining us this morning. Um, a warm welcome to you all, especially the, the, the guest speakers we have today. The purpose is, and I want to say thank you as well to, to SIPSI and TUSLA for sponsoring this event. The, the main theme of the, is, is the focus of this seminar will, will be to provide an overview of the nonviolent resistance program, to hear how it's working on the ground from a parent's point of view, luckily enough we have Andy here, and from a practitioner's point of view, and to provide clarity on how it's been rolled out across North Dublin. Again, it's, it's, this is to give people who are actually interested in NVR or wanting maybe to, to train up in NVR to see what it's like and what it entails. Um, the seminar is aimed at professionals who are interested in becoming practitioners or professionals who may be working with families that experience child violence, parent violence, and would like to know more about the programme before referring a parent. So you're very welcome. I'm delighted to say we have uh, Dr. Declan Coogan here again today, this morning. And before I introduce him, I just want to introduce him. He's a lecturer on the Masters of uh, Arts in Social Work Programme, Research Fellow, UNESCO, Child and Family Research Centre, School of Politics, Science and Sociology, Aras Moy, Moy Ola, National University of Ireland, Galway. And Declan has actually developed and continues to facilitate two-day evidence and practice-based training program on nonviolent resistance for children to parent violence and abuse of, for practitioners. Declan is a member of the Irish Association of Social Workers and is also a registered systemic family therapist with the Family Therapy Association of Ireland. And Declan is currently the chairperson of the NBR Ireland. Very busy man indeed. Um, again, Declan, thank you so much for joining us. I'm really interested in hearing what your, your presentation this morning. And without further ado, um, please take the floor and very welcome. Good morning, folks. Can you hear me? Yes. It looks like the screen has frozen. Let's see. This is the choice of technology. Okay. Let me see. Yeah, I have a frozen screen here. Good, Declan, thank you. Okay. Good morning, folks, and I'm delighted to be here. Uh, it's, I'm coming to you from, uh, from Galway, uh, where it's hot and it's warm, cloudy and wet. Um, a great combination. Um, but we're used to this here in Galway. I was saying before we began, that I've had a Murphy's Law morning. Um, anything that could go wrong at home went wrong. I couldn't find the keys, couldn't find the wallet, couldn't find the phone. And then I got here and couldn't connect. And then I thought we were over Murphy's Law episodes and then the screen froze. Anyway, um, it's working now again, thankfully. So I'm very happy to be here. And I'm going to be talking about partnership, prevention and support with NBO. Over the next um, half hour, we're going to talk about what is the problem? What's the difference between the problem and other ones? We'll be looking at practitioners, parents, and the pandemic. Uh, what has COVID-19 done for families? And what do we see as workers when we work with um, uh, uh, parents and children living with uh, violence within the home? What are the common factors? What do people share in common no matter where this problem is emerging? Importantly, we'll talk about what can we do and how can we help? I'll be suggesting that this is a human rights issue and then we'll pause uh, by looking forward to the future, looking at NVR today and in the future. Uh, a few times during uh, this, this morning, I'll be asking people to pause, to reflect for a moment, to make notes. And at the end of our morning, we'll have time for Q&A. This will give you a chance to make notes or anything that occurs to you that you want to ask towards the end. But I'll be emphasizing a lot uh, this morning uh, the themes of prevention, partnership and support 
using NVO as a basis for that and as a tool for that. So I'm working here in NUI Galway um, where I uh, am involved in the training of new social workers and also in research around uh, child parent violence and abuse uh, and LGBT uh, issues. And my background before I came to Galway was uh, 14 years in practice with children and families. I was 10 years working with what, what was then called the Matter Child and Adolescent Mental Health Service based out in Swords, um, and a member of the Association of Social Workers in Ireland and also a psychotherapist here in Galway uh, with a small practice. And the first time I came across what we now know as child parent and violence and abuse was when I was working as a social worker and a psychotherapist with the Matter Cams in Swords. We began to hear in about 2008 people talking about being afraid of their child. This was new to us because we were used to hearing people talk about uh, being afraid of the implications of a diagnosis for their child. Will they be able to have the kind of job in future they want because they're diagnosed with X, Y, or Z? Um, but around 07, people began to talk to us. Parents and foster carers, adoptive parents began to talk about being worried and afraid of their child, about how their child treats them. And we began to wonder then as a team, how can we help families in these situations? Because it seemed that the usual way of approaching these through what I believe are very good parenting groups or, or parenting sessions with couples or single lone parents, it didn't seem to work from what we were told by parents and carers. So we had to find another way of helping these families uh, so that parents would no longer be afraid of their child and wouldn't be living in fear. And that's when we came across a nonviolent resistance, which was first developed by a guy in Israel called Haim Omer, a professor of psychology in Tel Aviv University. And he had written an article where he shared research on the effectiveness of this model. It seemed easy to follow to us. Uh, we spoke together as a team about this, wondering, would we use it? Well, we got in touch with Haim Omer himself and asked, would you mind if we adapted this for use in Ireland? He said, yes, thankfully. And then we talked to parents and said, what about trying this? We're not sure if this will work in Ireland. We know what works in, in Israel and other parts of the world. It'll be the first time trying it here. What do you think? Shall we try it? And we tried it and it seemed to work, which leads us to where we are today. So what are we talking about? We're talking about what can often feel like the unwanted house guest in a family, uh, where some parents and carers and families experience persistent anxiety and fear. They feel powerless, hopeless and lonely. They're uncertain about how to be the parent within their home. They're afraid if they insist on routine uh, things such as school attendance, such as respect for each other, um, such as sharing, that they will be attacked that they will be assaulted in some cases. Uh, so where do we start as practitioners? What do we do when we come across this kind of, of, of problem? I'm gonna suggest we start by naming what we see and hear. And we ask parents or carers if what we're talking about fits with their experiences. So this is where we start, having a clear definition of the problem a definition that fits with the parents' lives. So we're not coming as experts saying, this is what you're experiencing. We're saying, this is one idea, one way to describe this, what do you think? And it's not easy to describe because different definitions are used. One of the issues about these kinds of problems is that as practitioners, family therapists, social workers, family support workers who work with young people, we don't want to demonize them. We don't want to put all the blame on them. So it can be very hard to talk about what we're talking about today. But what we do know is the problems we're talking about today, which I'll call for short, child to parent violence and abuse. It starts with verbal abuse often, but it escalates over time to emotional and physical abuse in some cases. So I suggest that we name it. And I'm gonna start by suggesting a clear definition of the problem. I suggest that we're talking about an abuse of power through which a child or adolescent under the age of 18 coerces, controls, or dominates parents or carers. Throughout today, I'll be talking about parents, child to parent violence. When I say that, please understand I also mean foster carers, adoptive parents, grandparents, um, same-sex parents, parents parenting alone, um, to anybody who has responsibility as a parent, as a carer for a child under the age of 18. 
these problems are also known as child to parent violence and abuse. And sometimes it, people speak about these problems as if it's intentional and it can be intentional, as in the child is deliberately trying to abuse parents or carers. But in my experience and the experience of colleagues involved with uh, NV or Ireland, this isn't always the case. So how do we know whether we're talking about child to parent violence and abuse and what could be described as the routine challenges of childhood when uh, every child at some point in their lives stands up to parents and there's a row and there's a shouting match and maybe a door slammed. How do we know the difference between child to parent violence and abuse which needs help from practitioners and other issues which will pass by as time goes on? The issues of power and fear clarify the difference between child to parent violence and abuse and what we might call the usual challenges of childhood. If parents feel that they must adapt their behavior due to threats or the use of violence or abuse by a child, then we're talking about child to parent violence and abuse. So we're still in the middle of coming out rather we hope of COVID-19, but let's look at how COVID-19 has impacted on the lives of children and families living with child to parent violence and abuse. I want to talk about some work done by um, uh, Barbara Condry and her colleagues in, uh, in England. And she did, they did an online survey and got the responses of 109 parents who had experienced child to parent violence and abuse and 47 practitioners working with families living in England. And this is what they found. 70% of parents reported an increase in violence during lockdown. So the violence here is physical assault. 69% of practitioners reported increase in referrals for families experiencing child to parent violence and abuse. So practitioners in England who are working in the area got more and more referrals about this issue uh, during the period of, 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 of lockdown in England. What they also found was 64% of practitioners said that the severity or frequency of child to parent violence and abuse had increased. And what's really interesting, 29% of parents stated that there was actually a decrease in child to parent violence and abuse. And if you think about it, it makes sense because in some families, the violence and abuse centers around going to school. Now, of course, when we were all in intense lockdown periods, there was no school. So of course, that source of stress, that source of conflict was removed. But they were concerned about what would happen when school returns. What about Ireland? What we do know, and it's indicated by the amount of people tuning in here today and who may see this afterwards uh, through YouTube online or through the Tusla website, practitioners in many services working with families are increasingly encountering child to parent violence in their work. And for Parent Line, which is a parent support telephone, national telephone support line, child to parent violence and abuse is the single largest reason for parents calling the service. What did they discover in 2020, last year, at the height of lockdown? What they found was that there was a doubling of calls to Parent Line from parents living with their son or daughter's anger and aggression. Overall, contacts with Parent Line went from almost 3,000 phone calls. 2019 to well over 4,000 calls last year in 2020. And over a quarter of these calls come from parents or carers talking about and often fearful of the abusive and or violent behaviour towards them from their child under the age of 18. So I'm going to suggest we take a pause for the moment and make some notes for yourself either mentally or on your phone or computer or piece of paper and pen. We've spoken so far about what problem we're we talking about. What is the difference between, say, child to parent violence and abuse and what could be seen as the usual challenges of childhood? We've talked about the experience of parents and of practitioners of child to parent violence and abuse during the pandemic. We're going to talk in just a moment about families living with child to parent violence and abuse. What do we see as practitioners? What do those families seem to share in common? Also, what can we do? We also talk about envy or in. Ireland today and in the future. So we'll take a moment for that to reflect. So think for a moment, what comments or questions uh, do you have about what you've heard or thought about so far this morning? And at the end of the webinar, uh, as John was saying at the beginning, there'll be time for questions and discussions afterwards. So what do we see? What do we see when we listen to the stories of parents or carers living with child to parent violence and abuse? 
what do we hear? What do we see when young people talk to us about these kinds of challenges? I'm going to suggest both from our experience and also from research that there are three things that families living with child to parent violence and abuse share in common. It occurs right across the social strata. This problem does no difference between poverty and wealth. It does no difference between gender or race. It does no difference between nationality. But this, the same kinds of things seem to occur across all families living with child to parent violence and abuse. There are parents who feel isolated and alone without support. They feel they can share this with nobody, that nobody would understand them, or that if they do talk about it, they'll be blamed. What we also see are escalation cycles that lead to abuse and violence. Conflict is normal in families. It's normal in all relationships. So we're not suggesting there should never be any conflict. But what happens in some families is that conflict leads to an escalation habit over time where there's abuse and violence. These parents are also living in fear of their child and they feel helpless or hopeless. So let's ask ourselves for a moment, if fear and helplessness, isolation, and relationship habits with escalation cycles are common among all families living with these kinds of uh, problems, what could we do that might be helpful? What might be the first step? I would suggest that we can help with NVO by taking a stance of partnership, by making very clear with parents that we stand with them. And we take the view that there is never any excuse for abusive behavior, not mental health diagnosis, not experiences in the past, not trauma. They might help us understand why something is happen happening, but they are never an excuse for abuse. We also take a partnership stance by talking with parents and carers and asking them to take a similar stance with us, as in, there was never any excuse for abuse. And we ask them to commit to non-violence and to resistance. We support parents by looking for and providing support for concrete skills and practical support that restore parents' competence and competence. We also talk about a support we provide support by asking parents or showing parents about how to, for example, de-escalate, press the pause button, increase positive parental presence, increase parent self-care. We also are talking about partnership and prevention. So we're looking out for and asking about different habits and patterns of relation and interaction. We suggest that some might change, but reinforce others knowing that there, of course, there are times when parents are doing a very difficult job very well. We build on those strengths. We also uh, embody support and partnership. We help parents reduce their social isolation by building up with them the NVO support network and by getting an agreement with those members of the support network on what they can each concretely do. So is this a human rights issue? I'm going to suggest that what we're talking about here is a human rights issue. Let's look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article 3 says that everyone has the right to life, liberty, security of person. Article 5 says that no one should be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. What you don't see here is everyone except parents or carers, has the right to life, liberty, and security of person. What you don't see here is no one, except parents or carers, should be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment. And what parents, some parents are telling us about though, is torturous, it's cruel, it's inhuman, it's degrading, it's punishment. So this is why we talk about child parent violence and abuse as a human rights issue. It's a human rights issue for parents, it's a human rights issue for children, because of course this has a huge impact on the child attaining their rights as children in our society. So the challenge we face is to form a partnership with parents and to take a clear position with them against these problems, not against the child, and to empower families to prevent future abusive or violent behaviour. 
So this is another pause point, folks. I want to ask you to take a moment to make a note of any questions or responses that come to your mind in relation to this, these issues as human rights concerns. So what do practitioners in Ireland say about nonviolent resistance? I'm not going to describe this research in detail, uh, other than to say it was part of my PhD project. It involved interviews and um, questionnaires from practitioners in different parts of Ireland, in Dublin and in the uh, west and uh, midwest of Ireland. Um, but what I will do is I will tell you that following the two-day NVO training program, parents reported that at follow-up, their sense of self-efficacy significantly increased as a result of the training. Their awareness and understanding of child to parent violence increased significantly, and their confidence and their skills in dealing with this issue uh, increased significantly. They also told us that uh, NVR had positive outcomes when it was used by parents or carers with whom they worked. I want to share with you um, some anonymized quotes from different practitioners who took part uh, in, the, um, in the training and in the research. Um, and what you will see here is partnership, uh, support, and prevention. This is Sean, who was working in a family support centre. And he said, I think NVO looks like a very good approach, where parents have really lost, you know, their own sense of their power. I don't know if you can hear that, folks. There's thunder in the rest of Ireland. And they are feeling a sense of helplessness and hopelessness around it. Kean was a child protection and welfare social worker. And he said, so I think the model, the steps were quite clear and I liked that about it. It was kind of something that you could get your head around and, and take a parent through. And Kate, who is also a child protection social worker said that, that was one of the main things that stood out for me about it. It was kind of more cooperative and open and with dialogue, people feel more listened to. So let's talk about NVR in Ireland today and into the future. At the moment, there's about, there's over 800 practitioners trained in NVR in Ireland. And they're starting together with parents in different services, for example, in mental health, in family support, in youth justice, psychotherapists in private practice, and in Tussle as well. There's also practitioner and researcher partnerships for example, there was the RCPV project. There's more information about that on nvrireland.ie. There's also a practitioner who is doing a part-time PhD and she's talking with parents about their experience of the NVR model. What do they think about it? Has it been helpful? And at the moment, I'm involved in an ongoing research project which talks to practitioners about what do they believe are the key ingredients of NVR. Practitioners in a wide range of services throughout Ireland provide NVR on an ad hoc basis. There is no one service uh, providing uh, NVR. There is no one identified service that says, if you're living with child to parent violence and abuse, here we are, come to us. The National Telephone Support Service, I mentioned earlier, called ParentLine, offers NVR as one of the supports for parents who call them. There is also the NVR Ireland Network and Steering Committee, which is made up of practitioners and researchers around Ireland who are committed to developing NVR, making it more readily available for people. I'm happy to, happy to tell you that on Monday, the 1st of November, not October, that's a misprint there, uh, the 1st of November, for five weeks, we'll be starting an online course uh, for practitioners, uh, both basic and advanced, 10 to 4, uh, over five Mondays. And there's more information about that on the link you see there. And different colleagues are also offering NVO training around Ireland. What's next? A practitioner needs to be lucky to find NVR Ireland. I really hope that this would change because we need much more training in NVR. We don't have the resources uh, to provide the kind of number of training that we're being asked to provide. A parent needs to be lucky to find NVR. This is not correct. A parent who needs this kind of support should be able to access it easily. That is not the case at the moment. A question we're facing is, how can we join evidence-based research and practice together where the evidence is limited? We're also wondering, what is the essential principles and practices of NVO? We have some ideas, of course, but we, we want to have research to support our position or indeed to challenge our position. We're wondering how to include more the voice 
and place of the child in NVO intervention. As I'm sure many of you know, NVO works with parents solely uh, and yet is still effective. And also what I'm hoping for is that in the future, NVO can be seen as a way of working with families that enhances prevention, protection, partnership and support. It's what I see in here in my work. It's what our colleagues using NVO are seeing here in their work. But we would like for that to be recognized and supported around the country in a wide range of different services officially. I'm going to close with a last word from a parent. Um, this was somebody uh, whom I worked uh, recently and she was talking about what it was like to have finished her work with NVO and how life has changed for her and her family uh, as a result of their involvement with NVO. And uh, we're calling this young person Peter. Um, uh, that's not his real name. Uh, he was um, the source of lots of anxiety and worry at home. He had been assaulting his parents, both mom and dad, and his siblings. And he was also diagnosed with two mental health difficulties as well. So this is what um, mom reported to me and said I could share this with people that I'm talking to about NVO. She says, recently, I met with a person with similar challenges as myself, who suggested rightly there was nothing more I could give to Peter and any member of my family until I gave myself something. And for the mom in this case, giving herself something included committing to NVO, to nonviolence and resistance. She said, I also took her advice and stood back and I feel much better for it. And that involved standing back from seeking advice on how to help Peter for a while, but rather how to help myself. And she would have seen NVO as a way of helping herself. Meanwhile, we had Peter home for a break and he seems to be finding himself very slowly when we had moments of fun. The difficulties with which Peter and his family were living were so intense that he had to spend some time in an inpatient um, care centre in mental health. He is taking an interest in himself more now, and he looks stunning at a family wedding with us last week. So I wanted, what I wanted to do was to end with a message of hope from a parent who lived through the most difficult of circumstances together with her uh, husband and with her other children and with her child who were calling Peter, and they came through the most difficult times, and NVO was part of that. So thank you very much, folks. I'm um, really looking forward to hearing what comes next. You have some great speakers lined up today. I'm looking forward to uh, the Q&A at the end of our time. Thank you. Well, Declan. Declan, thank you. I've got my hands up clapping. I, 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 this is one thing I don't like about Zoom. We can't clap very well. But can I, can I just say I really, really appreciate that um, input this morning. But also, just on behalf of the practitioners who are trained in NVR and running courses in Dublin North, for, for what you've done to bring it to us here in Ireland. And and your ongoing support. I know you're also you're willing to We seem to have lost our chair. <laughs> this is the joy of technology. Was acknowledging I think just John was acknowledging the work that Deccan has done um, in bringing NVR to Ireland along with his colleagues um, from NUI and developing the programme and passing it on and supporting um, the development of NVR in Ireland. And certainly there's, there's very much appreciated. Um, and, it's, and, and I suppose it's great to have you here this morning and people have get a sense of who you are, where you've come from and, and, and the work that you do. Um, so thank you very much, Declan. Um, I suppose the next, and as Declan said, look, if, if people could stay and, and, and make note of questions that we will have uh, questions and answers at the end of, the, of this morning's um, webinar. So I suppose we'll move on to the next, um, the next um, um, uh, sort of part of the morning. And we have a speaker, um, Andrew, and, or, or Andy O'Reilly, who has been through the programme and he's going to share with us his experiences of, of um, of, of the NVR program. Andy, if you would like to begin, it's great and it's lovely to have you and we're delighted to, 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 that, you, that you're here to speak. Okay, thank you, Andy. Thank you very much. Um, it's been um, a, a privilege to be asked to speak here today about the experiences that myself and my family have experienced through NVR. And just listening to some of the comments there that John was making has brought me back to so, so many memories where it was and 
and where myself and my family are today. I said I'd come on and speak about, you know, my experience in itself. Um, we did our MVR training online through uh, Microsoft Teams, and it was done for two hours each week over about an eight-week period, which suit my family lifestyle, a uh, very busy lifestyle. So um, that was absolutely fantastic for us. Um, when I remember day one, I logged on, a um, small group of people felt very comfortable, a bit quiet and shy at the start. And what I'd find is as the course went on was that the integration between everybody, uh, the communication between everybody, listening to everybody's stories made myself and my wife really, really feel that we're not the only family out there that dealing with some of these difficulties and so on. Um, unfortunately, halfway during our course, we did have the cyber attack, which I know a lot of people are infected by it, but we did complete the course on a one-to-one -one basis. And I, even though I got a lot out of uh, the one-to-one -one base, I missed that interaction. I missed being a part of everybody's journey and listening to everybody's progress and how they were getting on. So that was a, a, a big point. The group session was definitely something that, was, that I would recommend going forward. Um, people ask me why um, I decided to go for a, an MVR training. Um, you know, I've got five children aged between eight and 22. And um, I feel like uh, raising a 22-year-old 20, to raising um, a 10 or 14-year-old in today's generation is so, so much different. I, I question my parents' skills so much, you know, with some of the issues that I was having with anxiety, self-esteem, social media, technology, online gaming, for that matter. Um, the challenges that we faced, uh, the, the, the confrontation, even asking one of the kids to get ready for a football match or, you know, let, let, calling you in for your dinner. The, the challenges that we had were, were extremely difficult and the confrontation were so heated at times that I felt like I had to do something about that. Um, so when MVR was recommended to me, um, you know, I took part in the course. I believe the tools that I learned were fantastic and I implemented that into our day-to-day -day life. Um, just sim simple things by, as mentioned before, pressing that pause button sounds so simple, but the effects were absolutely amazing. Revisiting certain situations, when is the right time to revisit those situations? Consistency. Even though I was doing a lot of the, a lot of the work already, just being consistent. And um, that, that, that was a big one for me. Another part of the, was the support network. Um, for me, it was my family support. I brought in my wife, my older children, my grandparents, and we sat down and we addressed the situation that we were dealing with as a family. We, you know, we couldn't continue with the, the arguments, the confrontation, the, the heated moments. And we all sat down and we all agreed to be on the same page and the consistency that, you know, that the child would see and hear from us all just took the burden off my shoulder straight away. And it felt like that was really, really um, shared among so many of us. And I have to admit that the differences were a lot quicker than I expected. You know, uh, hearing the same message, no mixed messages, um, just made it made a hell of a difference all the way through. So um, I do believe that that support network was a big key and consistency was a big key for, for what I learned in, in MVR. Um, I'm also a foster carer and I have been for 15 years. And I would have a lot of children uh, come and stay with ourselves a lot, have moved on now and, you know, have gone to college and apprenticeships and so on. But nowadays you're having a lot of children that are coming with a lot of violence. And it, I, as I said, bringing up different kids and different generations, I did question my parenting skills. And what MVR was, it gave me the unbelievable confidence that what I was doing was right. I just need to tweak a few things here and there. and. Um, I do believe that sit, sitting in that course made a hell of a difference. Our family environment is so much better. Um, there's a lot more laughter, conversations, integrations. Um, the family life is just eased off a little bit. And I do believe I've taken them tools that I learned from the course. And I am really, really bringing that into it on a day-to-day -day basis. And it is a couple of months now since I've been in NVR. And the changes, I, I cannot. I, it's just been so, un, so unreal, so unreal. Seeing some of them slideshows and seeing some of those pictures, that was me. That was me. That's, the, that's where we were. And the small differences have made an unbelievable change to our family lifestyle. So I wanted this opportunity to say to many foster carers, many parents and so on out there, that 
you know, it, it was a course that was recommended to me, thankfully. So I do hope that MVR really gets shared among everybody out there. And I do believe there's many, many parents that could really benefit from the MVR training. And um, I just wanted to take this opportunity to say how we are and things are actually working really, really well now. I just want to say thank you very much for that opportunity. Andy, uh, can I just say again, round of applause. Uh, thank you very much. It's inspirational just to hear you um, and, you know, the support that you get. And actually that, that group stuff as well, that, that how important it is sometimes to be part of a group and, and see you're not alone. And as parents, that's really a, a strong message that we're not alone in this. And uh, a lot of us are experiencing this. So. I can't thank you enough for coming and sharing that with the group today. It kind of inspires me as a practitioner to keep going with it. And uh, so I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. And again, we will have questions at the end if anybody wants to, um, to take a note of a question for Andy. I hope you'll stay with us and, and maybe share some of your more answers if, if they're there. Oh, so well. again, and I, I love that. Uh, thanks again, Andy. Um, and again, sorry, Declan, I got cut off. And thanks, Tom, for stepping in for me. I love all your pauses. I just think they're very, they were very good in your presentation as well. It, it is nice to pause every, every few minutes. And just before we go on to Siobhan McGowan, again, as a practitioner, again, just to pause for about, you know, three or four seconds, just to let what Andy said just sink in. And as you say, uh, Declan, maybe take notes of, of, of what inspired you or what, what struck with you. So, yeah, thanks again, Andy. And uh, Siobhan, I'd like you to, um, you're welcome to invite you to, to speak about your experience as a practitioner with NVR. So you now have the floor and uh, you're very welcome. Follow that. It was absolutely a privilege listening to both Declan and Andy there, mm -hmm. you know, what they had to say. Uh, you might see me look away for a couple of minutes. I just have a few prompts there to help myself, you know, yes, uh, just while I'm speaking. And I suppose just to quickly say that my name is, as you said, is Siobhan McGowan. And I'm a project worker in St. Helena's and I have been for roughly seven, 27 years. And over that time, I've been involved in uh, many programs with parents and children. I love ch working with children and I also uh, work with um, adults also. And I've been involved in parenting courses over those years, roughly five, the Veritas Parenting Program initially. Also then the um, Matter Guidance moving on to Triple P, Circle of Security, and now the MVR. And I also, as a parent myself, benefited from originally doing parenting course myself because of that old thing of saying that if children are, don't come with a manual and we all need support around parenting. And even as pra practitioners, you know, we're all human beings living in this world, trying to survive and trying to, you know, manage our family lives and our lives in general. So I found the be, it's also very supportive for me over the years being um, involved in parenting programs, very challenging as well. And when obviously when I came to being involved in the MVR parenting program initially, uh, when I heard it was non-violence resistance parenting and all that sort of thing, I was kind of a bit, I was a bit um, anxious, obviously, at first, because I was saying, God, I'd never really, you know, how will I, how will I actually deal with people? experiencing violence in their relationships with their children. But that was very quickly, um, what would I say, uh, put at ease for me because I felt the uh, MVR parenting program really resonated with me. I thought it's a, I think it's a wonderful program. I couldn't speak highly enough about the, you know, the benefits, what it offers to people. And um, I was really, really privileged, I felt, to be actually uh, to go on the training and begin to support families, because I think that is a privilege to actually support people in their parenting skills in their lives. We all need it. And this, the, the MVR really, really, really spoke to me. Um, I suppose, um, you know, as I said, it was going to be very challenging and it brought its own anxieties for me, me initially. Um, I suppose as a practitioner then, you know, obviously we have to plan these programmes and uh, when I did the parenting, the, the MVR parenting myself, it was before COVID and um, I facilitated one with a couple of other practitioners and we um, obviously met in a group setting because it was OK to do that then. And these ways of working with people, I find much more, you know, beneficial and good because obviously you're in a room with people, you can see them face to face, they can get a sense of you and you can get a sense of them. And it's, it's lovely. 
But um, I suppose uh, what I found brilliant about the MBR as well was that you must set aside time, I would say to facilitators, again, with the, within your work, ma time management and that essential was the meeting with parents each, like there were three facilitators in my group, I think there were 12 parents and each of those facilitators met with three of the parents. And we actually devoted roughly an hour minimum to that, that first meeting. And that offered the parent, I feel, the opportunity to get, you know, to offload a very, you know, they obviously feel extremely vulnerable because they're coming with this um, to talk about something, maybe feeling a bit very inadequate, feeling that exposed that here I am, why can't I parent properly, that this is happening in my life. So that meeting, I I thought was, I think is essential to know each other and to actually, before you actually head into An awful lot of that I might. Sorry about my, that. My, no, that's not your problem. <laughs> Thank you very much <laughs> for, for for your your input. So, yeah. Well, I move. I, will I continue? Please do. Yes. I'm. I'm sorry, if you just came back, on, so that. please do. Yeah. Yeah. So I suppose that's what I'm saying. The, the initial meeting and then moving into the group. That, that you know, as a practitioner, like working with the family, I think that's that that was essential. And then after that, obviously, we we um. You know that that hour needs to be set aside obviously just for the one-to-one -one with the parent get a sense of everything put them at ease get to know them get to know what the situation is and then uh moving forward then into the group also then obviously then um when covid arrived that kind of pushed that um out of the water i work i um worked with um a couple of families on in on phone conversations so obviously you didn't get to meet them personally and you didn't get the opportunity to have that long conversation with them either because what you had you had information but this um but in, in a way i still felt that that in its own sense worked very well also you know that just um the i felt the phone conversations were also equally beneficial to people at that particular time when god loved them they had no nowhere to turn and no outreach that they were actually getting the opportunity to have you know, these one to one conversations to support them in their, you know, in their situations. And um, I suppose that in itself, you know, was brilliant for them. I suppose, um, again, um, it's a very delicate subject, obviously, for people and, you know, bringing up their, their these issues. But uh, I suppose also for a practitioner, it's using all the skills you've gained over the years to, you know, support people in that and to make them feel comfortable, make them feel OK, that it is OK, that these are parenting issues. Unfortunately, these, this is life and these things happen and how we interact as practitioners with people also bringing our own experiences and being human with them also takes all that um, maybe that other grey area out of it. So I suppose that's just me um, speaking in relation to just the being a practitioner and initially going into the MBO pro parenting program and then also what I feel was would benefit does benefit parents and definitely the one-to-one -one meeting at the beginning and all that sort of thing and then moving into the group um from there I suppose I suppose was, uh, the next piece was to observe the benefits for parents that I felt over the um if you just give me a minute now, I'm just moving down here just to keep myself. Yeah, take it. I hope I've I've said enough on that now at the minute. So um just moving in then to observing the benefits of um the MVR for parents. As I said already, the initial meeting where the parents and pra practitioner come together, you know, to make with, for the family issues, um, it breaks down barriers and offers the parents the space to offload their worries. And I definitely saw that that did benefit the parents, that meeting, you know, definitely. They felt kind of heard and also that um, it was a safe space to talk and that they weren't being judged, 
and that their family life wasn't being judged. And I think that that is essential for parents, people to feel that, because otherwise you'll just run. Now, in my experience also, as we know, the MVR is a voluntary, um, you know, you do volunteer, you don't have to do it if you don't want to. A couple of times, and I would speak to people, like just maybe even on the phone, about doing the parenting program, even though they have major issues with their children. But, oh, well, no, it's not for me, Siobhan. I want the help for her. She needs counselling, she needs this, but that was okay. Then people will come back at their own time. Um, again, I suppose, um, um, they begin, they, I suppose, sorry about this. Just bear with me for a moment. Yeah, take um, your time. Yeah, because I suppose, yeah, I was going to say there again, I'm going over that the, um, that meeting is really essential. I think it's the main, one of the main elements of bringing the, you know, of the MVR program because it's settling everything. I also, uh, brilliant with the MVR program, and I think Andy was speaking there to us, and Declan, all the elements attached to the MVR are spectacular. Because again, I think the crucial thing is that parents, initially they make the commitment to nonviolence, and that's the beginning of the change. And again, because they feel they because they have that support and they're in a space now where it's out in the open, they've, you know, they've come out, if you like, they've spoken about something that maybe they've been trying to hide because they felt ashamed, because they felt embarrassed, because they felt, you know, they didn't want to really put their their child or their young adult down. But at the same time, they were feeling demoralized and everything, you know, so vulnerable. And yet. Once they made that step forward to get the help that they needed and, and commit to non-violence was the beginning of positive and wonderful change in their lives. And that commitment and persisting and resisting was the, was the key. And I found that even with parents, like a lot of the time, they loved the um, thing of not getting on the escalator, you know, that visual, you know, instead of like one of the women, like she was always on the escalator, always ready to pounce waiting for the, you know and and she went I spent the majority of people that said that element of don't get on the escalator you know press the pause button strike when the iron's cold was massive mm -hmm. you know knowing what their triggers were what what, what they they want to look at and then beginning those making those changes gave them a sense I suppose of control again coming from as Declan was saying, and Andy was saying there, you know, coming from that space where you were actually felt submissive in a desperate place, really, and even come back to human rights issues, that a parent was suffering all this. And yet now all of a sudden, in a way, it was giving them, a, you know, a change, like they were beginning to, you know, self-calming issues, self-calming techniques to help them to, to move forward in a different way, to parent in a different way, in a more positive way. And that I saw was profound and had a great effect on the parents also. And then even, I suppose now, just give me a minute again, if you don't mind. Um, I just moved down here. I have two things going here at the minute. Um, oh, another wrong thing. I'm after going the wrong way, sorry about this. Bear with me for a minute. Yes, so, um, you know, then even that new sense of a new authority, you know, people were beginning to, like, you're trying to, as a, as, as a practitioner, encourage that sense of new authority, you know, where people were, where will you get in here, you know, you'll do as I say, and all that sort of thing, and getting locked into that battle. When you tried, when we were introducing this new authority that like, again, you can change, you don't, you know what I mean? It's not the old way, but it doesn't mean that um, a new authority is allowing them walk all over you or that, but it means that you are regaining um, a, 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 a authority in a very thought through manner. You know where you're coming from now. You're more deliberate in your, in your own actions and behavior in relation to the, the child or the young person and in relation to the way you react to their the way they treat you mm -hmm. so i suppose in that positive parental presence um again taking charge in a more mu mutually respective way 
I think, was powerful as well for them. People loved the, the, the positive parental presence at first. I don't think at times people, um, you know, were understanding. But then as they really began to understand and and get away from that thing of, well, why should I be doing that or a P? Well, and that, that it wasn't to be done with um, whether they were behaving well or not. You just did it for the love of them because you loved that child. Do you know what I mean? And you were separating the behavior from the person. Beginning to do that again, I think, again, they loved that as well. You know, when they saw that, oh God, yeah, like that you could separate the behavior from the child was powerful, was a powerful tool for them as well, because it allowed them, it freed them up a bit from always being, I know the, all these things within the, the MVR, separate them from always having to be the bad guy, always being there for the hard stuff. Do you know what I mean? When you start to separate the behavior from the child, even they, you know, they began to see that, oh God, this is different now and I can see you know and you begin but I've noticed I have noticed that another pair of always in parents we were inclined to hone in on the, the bad behavior and miss all the good stuff so when it offered the that's what MBR also does offers the opportunity even in these deeply deeply difficult circumstances for families and for parents when they actually get the opportunity to you know see that they can move and that they can actually look at their child or their young person you know, and see some of their qualities also, it begins to make the shift. And the random acts of kindness, all that sort of, you know, all these elements and, you know, were powerful. And parents, you could see that parents were um, really, really, you know, supported by this. I'll also, when Andy mentioned there, the support network, letting their guard down, realizing now they need to speak to somebody, getting out of the silence, not having to be quiet anymore about the fact and, and worrying, I suppose, too, as we say, we often said, say that um, they don't want their child shamed. It's not about shaming the child. It's not about shaming them, but it's about getting support. And once they were open to the support network and and also that it was for the love of the family, trying to, you know, as a practitioner, getting this across to parents, this is about a holistic approach to the look for the love of the family. You know, it's not about shaming the child, but it's also about saying very firmly that we want help because this has to stop, but that it's not going to be that that little brat, you know, and there are ways of working through. And when you get the support around you, you can make those changes and begin to move forward again. And the weight that you can see of parents, you know, shoulders and the, the beginning of positive changes, again, was, is, was very, very um. I suppose it's a privileged place to be again for a practitioner when you see that things are working for them. And that's what MVR does, I think. The building blocks that MVR offers families is, are powerful and they're wonderful. And I feel like as you know, my experience in working with the pair with parents, it's a privilege that when you see that somebody's coming from those difficult, that difficult and vulnerable situation to a more healthy and more you know, powerful in the best possible way. You're saying that about the person. You know, you. the positive parental presence is a more powerful way of being. Yeah. That they're taking back this control that they felt God help them. They they would have absolutely, you know, they didn't know where they were ever going to get that from. Um, but by doing you. the MVR program, and I say that, you know, um, absolutely, this was transformational for them. And you know, and I it just, is a wonderful, yeah. Can Sorry, I just say, Siobhan, you're, um, again, thank you so much. Your, your humanity is flowing out, which is brilliant. And you, as you say, we're all human beings trying to support each other. Mm -hmm. And it really comes across so strong. We're so lucky to have you for 27 years with that much experience. So really appreciate it. And you sum it up really well. Again, what I and I love it. I love the parents coming back and using those phrases, pressing the pause. Uh, you know, getting off the escalator, you know, they've been really empowered and taking back control. So really appreciate your um, your your input and um, really very valuable. So thank you very much. Um, before we, I think before we go on to, we have Tom and Evelyn now to speak about the rolling out of, of the NVR in, in our area and, and, and the wider area. And again, as Declan has said, there aren't enough uh, practitioners to run the courses. So we're, we're, we're kind of... Um, 
you know, we're kind of a growing community of MVR practitioners that will, will be around to support each other. And Tom will probably talk about that, how we continue to support each other in his, his presentation. So again, thank you very much, Siobhan. And uh, Tom uh, O'Donnell, if you're uh, free to speak now, we'd like to welcome you to the floor and um, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, and good morning, everybody. Um, my name is uh, Tom O'Donnell, and I'm the, the manager of Geraldton House Family Resource Centre in Ballymun. Um, Geraldton House is, will be part of TUSLA uh, Prevention Partnership and Family Support Services in the, in, in the in Dublin North City area. So I suppose I would have trained in NVR back in 2018, and since then I have been involved in delivering group pro program well one and a half programs since then and um, with COVID sort of it maybe changed that a little bit but also delivering uh, one to one programs um, over the phone and I suppose trying to support other practitioners across the, um, the, the Dublin North City area and trying to develop um, NVR in that area as well. So I suppose since COVID began um, um, what we have been sort of trying to we like <sighs> It was, it was it was a sort of like a stopping groups was was really really difficult thing to do and we didn't really know how we were going to move forward but we did and, and i suppose we've we've, we've been trying to facilitate mnvr um, via the phone which has worked surprisingly well in some cases and um, never would have taught it before but it has worked um I suppose for those for those of you you may not be familiar with but when I talk about the Dublin North City area, Dublin North City area would include um, network areas of, of Ballymun, um, Finglas, Cabra, Dublin Northeast Inner City, Dublin Northwest Inner City, um, and Dublin North Bay. Um, and I suppose just an early quick reflection on on NVR. Um, I suppose those of you who are you know are very new to NVR here today, or you are, or some of you may be thinking about becoming practitioners. I think the one thing that you will it will may or may occur to you as you become more familiar with NVR is that it's a. I, I mean, I believe it's a very respectful program. And what I mean by that, and I think Declan sort of alluded to this earlier, he talked about the idea of partnership. So like, practitioners don't come in as, as, as you know, the experts telling parents what to do. Um, and he talked about things about like, he, like his own personal skills as a parent weren't swept away, weren't sort of changed. He, he talked about being, gosh, some things were reinforced for him. That's been my experience of, of, of working with parents as well. Parents often talk about, you know, getting it right some of the time. And as Andy said, tweaking other parts. So it was very interesting to hear that. Uh, my thoughts are almost reinforced. And, and the idea of um, not demonizing children, because I think if we do, we sort of push them away. If we don't demonize them, we leave the door. We leave opportunities for them to be part of the solution as opposed to being part of the problem. So from those point of view, I just think it's, and I hope you will sort of, you know, as you become more familiar, you will agree with me that it is a very respectful program both to parents and to the young people. Um, that aside, I suppose the in in, in across in the DNC, the Dublin North City area, or what we call a DNC for short, um, with regard to the um, I suppose the TUSLA and um, the, the Prevention Partnership and Family Support Services, like the projects in the area, we plan to hopefully and across the network, we hope we hope to I suppose roll out um two NVR programs per year per network this has been the plan before before COVID and I suppose this will be this going forward now this will hopefully be the we will aim to do that as well but we'll also continue with the provision of one-to-one -one NVR programs with parents um as well alongside that um but, it'll, but also, as Declan noted, in addi additionally, there are other services, and there, NVR has been, um, I suppose, in the sort of Dublin North area. Not, not you know, it, maybe not as it's growing now, but it has been there. Other agencies have been, I suppose, carrying out um, sort of one to one programs. And this will also continue in parallel to the work that we do, that we do as well. So, Looking forward to the autumn of uh, 2021, um, we envisage that NVR, I suppose, group programs would be facilitated um, across the networks in the following ways. Now, that's, you know, we're hoping that that will, you know, COVID, you know, the develop, you know, 
things in, in the country as COVID hopefully becomes under maybe more control, we'll be able to do this. Um, for referrals that come in to the TUSLA uh, PPFS services, I mean, I suppose we're, we want to continue with the original aim of working in partnership with community agencies. So this is what we did this before COVID. We were working alongside um, local community agencies in the networks and um, delivering um, the program. So this, so we, we hope that there will be opportunities um, to, I suppose, to deliver this in partnership. Um, also, um, in parallel, community agencies may also identify groups of parents within their own service who are interested in participating in programs. So like individual agencies can also deliver the program as I suppose as a single agency, or they may sort of wish to sort of to deliver it in partnership with other agencies as well. From a, so that's the groups. So we hope that we hope to re, to begin groups again. And um, from a, the one-to-one -one, uh, point of view, I suppose PPFS services will continue to respond um, to one-to-one -one referrals across the networks. I suppose since COVID um, be, it began, what I've what I've been trying to do is to sort of coordinate referrals that come into Tusla and um, for NVR and sort of match sort of referrals with, with practitioners across the um the, the Dublin North City region. Um, so this will continue. Um, into the autumn, but also community agencies and um, it can also respond to their own, um, I suppose, I suppose referrals within their own agencies or requests within their own agencies. Now, the other thing is, is that hopefully, um, you know, as the as the demand is is is, if, if, you know, in 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 response to the demand, we may call on you know community agencies to assist us in delivering one to one as well. But if that depends on on demand. So, so we hope, so just in summary, we hope to um, begin uh, groups, uh, group programs again, but we will continue with the one-to-one -one sort of delivery as well. I think that there is advantages in, to both. I mean, I think, Siob I know Siobhan, you talked about the richness of the group and you also referred to the experience that you had within the group setting as well and what you got from that feeling that you're not alone. There are also other parents who prefer to maybe to work in a one-to-one in, in one to one work as way, way as well as well, so we will do both um part a uh, part of uh, um of uh i suppose developing NVR across dublin north um we've we've i've tried to um i suppose uh i suppose uh, almost sort of borrow from what they've done in dublin south and and set up a peer support group so like with that in mind all practitioners all nvr practitioners will be invited to attend nvr peer support sessions now i suppose uh, it, practically they will maybe take place maybe three times per year once per, t per term um so what are what are these i suppose these are opportunities to share experiences and um, delivering nvr because like what what tends to happen when, in, in peer support sessions is you have experienced nvr practitioners but also people who are very very new to it so it can be very when i was starting out i, I found it a very rich experience to go over and and and, and i suppose participate in the dublin south um peer support i got a, a you know a lot of support there um, and and so it's a, it's, a, it's a very valuable sort of forum to tease out issues and to and to and to share experiences there may be opportunities as well to invite speakers with a view to enhancing skills around nvr provision um, so all the practitioners that come that that have that train um in in dublin north um city will be added to a mailing list and then we'll, we'll receive sort of like notification of peer support, but they'll also receive copies of NVR literature and, and notices of seminars and future trainings. Um, NVR Ireland, um, would, which, which Declan is a chair of, and through one of the trainers, Tara Kelly in Dublin South, would, would sort of regularly sort of um, I suppose circulate NVR information and literature, or maybe some research has come from England. And I they would send that on to me, and I would sort of, circulate that to all practitioners as well in Dublin North City. So um, so that's peer support. So then in terms of monitoring and developing NVR, um, what we were what were, what were I suppose the aim is that we try and sort of track um, I suppose the development statistics and data and um, which are, which are, I suppose will give us will let us know I suppose what the issues and the and the demand for NVR across the area. 
So what we're asking then is that all practitioners would sort of maybe would, would, would forward um, anonymized statistics and data for, for area-based biannual reports. That, and this, suppose, uh, for, the, for the DNC area, that, uh, that, that they would come back to me. So I will be in touch with practitioners, um, you know, um, maybe once or twice a year, you know, to, to, I suppose, to look for data from them. Um, um, this will also, I suppose, this will also um, assess the need in, the, in Dublin um, North City to identify current issues and challenges. Do we need more practitioners trained up? I think from, from listening to Declan, the, the, the answer to that is a, a very obvious yes. Um, so in terms, just for any of you here this morning from the Dublin North City network areas, um, if you're wondering about referrals, um, certainly you can send referrals to myself um, if you can contact me um, on I, I can leave my email address um, at the end of this I don't not sure if that's that's on it but 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 you'd be able to contact me and I'd be able to send you a, a referral form you can send back to me and um, parents can also refer themselves as well um, in terms of demand um, at the moment in DNC, like uh, we at the moment have, because we have only been able to do one-to-one -one sessions, we have a waiting list of about 26 people because, but hopefully that waiting list will just disappear as soon as we begin to run groups again. Um, but we have, we have had limited um, uh, people who can actually deliver one-to-one -one, um, programs. Um, Finally, the we had do like you you may have received um a notification of training that's coming up. And um, so we have NVR practitioner training coming up that's been organized um um by, by Tusla PPFS services in conjunction with the uh, and funded by Sipsy Dublin North. Um, so that's coming up on October 5th and 6th. And for for any of you from the from the Dublin North City network areas, those application forms will be can come back to myself. And I know Evelyn from Dublin North is going to speak after me and she will explain in terms of, of application forms for the Dublin North area. So that's hopefully that's given you a sense of um, where we are in Dublin North City. If anything hasn't been clear, hopefully you've got an opportunity to make some notes or questions and I'd be happy to answer any questions in the questions and answer section after this. Okay, thanks for your attention and um, I'll hand you back to John. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom. Again, a round of applause for you. And again, we're really lucky to have you with your organization skills and the, and the kindness you uh, and generosity you have in anybody can contact you anytime about NVR. So that's really appreciated. And also that peer support, you facilitate that so well, which I think is really important. Again, creating that family of NVR practitioners. So again, thank you very much, Tom, for that. Over to yourself, Evelyn. How are you this morning? And uh, just looking forward to hearing from you. You're welcome. The floor is yours. Yeah, you can just jump off mute. Yeah, not yeah, that. I'm on mute. Lovely. Okay. You're welcome. Hi, Tom. Hi, everybody. Um, I actually think, Tom, you've covered a lot of what I was going to talk about, but that's fine because uh, I suppose the more you hear something, the better. In terms of, firstly, my name is Evelyn Murphy and I'm the Family Support Manager in Dublin North. And that Dublin North will cover the Dublin 5, 13 and 17 area. And we will be part of the SIPSI network. So hence, that's why we would be involved in this as well. And for those who don't particularly know, or for those um, potential uh, NVR practitioners, the Dublin 5 area covers Coolock, Harmonstown, Kilbarrick, Rahini, and Dublin 13 covers Baldoyle, Bayside, Clan Griffin, Donamead, and Sutton, and it's quite a huge area. And the Dublin 17 area will cover Coolock, mostly central Coolock, Balcamp, Darndale, and Priors Wood. So the NVR for us has been running since again, 2019. And at that point we had actually trained up four practitioners, one from Tusla and three from the community services. Uh, one was Kymore Youth Service and one would have been from the Astor Family Support Work Service. Now we all, I think um, prior to COVID two, courses were run and they were really, really very, very good, very successful. We had about 12 families in one and 10 in the other, but unfortunately COVID came and then we had to revert back to Zoom. 
and also one-to-ones. And I have to say, to our surprise, the Zoom worked really, really well, I have to say. And again, as you alluded to, Andy, unfortunately, um, the cyber attack came, so that put us back by about three to four weeks. But we ended up doing the one-to-one, so at least there was continuity in terms of delivery of service. And that seemed to benefit lots of the families as well. I think you were on one of ours as well, Andy, <laughs> so that's why we would know of you. Um, I suppose really, for us, when you look at where the referrals come from, the majority of our referrals actually come from the schools, from social workers, can be self-referral. Uh, CAMS would be a huge referral agency to ours. And in terms of social work, they would actually use NVR, I think is an excellent tool because it, it stops blocking up their system. So they would signpost it to PPFS, which means we, and that's the core of what we do, we're preventative service. Therefore, we're dealing with families when they're most at crisis because the program, the NVR program, gives back the authority to parents as already you've talked about, Siobhan. So that's prevents it from going into crisis to social work and it means it's more manageable in the community. Um, so I suppose the other little bit, what are the expectations we have um, from practitioners? And it would be that pe practitioners would run one group a year and also participate in one-to-one -one. and the biannual reports that you talked about, Tom. Now, I think that might sound like, oh God, that's loads of work, but in actual fact, it's really, really not. It's about uh, collating the information and that's, correct me if I'm wrong, Tom, but that would be very, amount, look at the amounts of referrals you have, the types of referrals, and it gives us all a tool if we need to modify it, because there's often patterns happening in terms of the level of violence. It could be more prominent in one particular area than in another. And that means then we can modify our delivery of the MVR to that particular area. And you also talked, Tom, about uh, peer support. I think uh, particularly as practitioners, that's really, really important, not just for experienced practitioners, but also for newly qualified practitioners. Meeting other people, it gives you the confidence to go back in and start presenting. And that's really what it's all about as a practitioner as well, knowing that, okay, these are the threads, these are the patterns that are happening, and how can I present that better to the families when you're in the, doing the training? Um, and I think, so it's about capacity building, really. I think that's mainly um, what our concerns, what, what, what we actually, what our expectations of practice. Practitioners would be. In In this area and we need a lot more you know, to do that piece of work so I think we do need people in the wings but what I would go and get that first NVR uh, under your belt Tom and I trained in NVR together and that was our biggest issue oh god where am I going to find the time what's going to happen but in actual fact there's tons of support out there so as potential practitioners really tap into that and use your resources as best you can and I think the peer support is excellent. Evelyn. Thank you very much. Again, round of applause for you too. Um, we are so lucky to have such a wealth of experience and uh, longevity in, in the workforce here that between yourself, Tom, and Siobhan. So um, again, such a vast amount of experience from a practitioner's point of view and to be bringing that to the NVR. So that's great. Um, before, just we're going to go into questions and answers now. So we're going to get to see everybody's faces, which would be great. So looking forward to that. Again, thank you very much for all the speakers, um, Andy, Tom, uh, Evelyn, Siobhan, and of course, Dr. Declan Coogan. Really appreciate that. Um, we're going to stop recording this now. And uh, so, Kleena, thank you so much for doing all the techie stuff. Um, I'd be lost trying to do all that. So fair play to you. Um, and if, if the rest of the participants could just unmute, and not unmute, on. On, um, take, take the video on, put the video on, you can stay on mute. And what we're going to do for this is kind of have it a nice relaxed kind of open, open floor. So if you either put up your hand physically or if you know how to use the chat, there's a reactions button down on the very bottom, that smiley face. If you press into that, you'll be able to see a hand raise. So um, 
And just to say thank you very much to all the participants who came today to our Responding to Child to Parent Violence NVR. And again, just to finish, I'd like to thank you, thank Tusla and Sipsi for sponsoring this. And our, our guest speakers, Evelyn, Tom, um, Kleena and Siobhan, and our special guest, Dr. Coogan, who was, uh, thank you very much for, uh, I know you're very busy for joining us today. And Andy, our parent, again, thank you so much for that. It really, from the, the main thing that came out for me in this seminar was we're giving authority back to parents to, to take back uh, the, the positive parenting, pressing the pause, getting off the escalator and then enjoying parenting again. So thank you very much to all and goodbye. <laughs>